Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. Um, today, I'm a filmmaker and I studied history at ANU and a former Canberran um, and live in Melbourne. And I wanted to talk to you about um, two film projects that I've made over the last four to five years, which were using um, the same collection uh, from the National Archives of Australia, which I kind of engaged with copyright in really fundamentally different ways to make two very different works from this same collection. Um, so the collection that I'm talking about is um, from the National Archives of Australia, and it was a collection relating to Australian film censorship. Um, before 1971, Australia had some of the most stringent um, censorship laws um, in comparison to, you know, to Britain, um, across Europe, to the US. And um, it was governed by the customs department because all these films were coming in and, um, and the films were being reviewed. And what our censors did was that they would cut out the little bits, sometimes mere frames and sometimes minutes, from these international films um, and cut them out before audiences could see them in Australia. And they would do this largely in secret, so the public had no idea that this was happening. Um, I was making a film about David Stratton, which was exploring censorship. And when I was kind of looking around for paperwork about this in the National Archives of Australia, I came across this collection um, of all these clips that had been cut out. It wasn't an entire collection of everything that had been cut out because it was astronomical, um, the content. It was what had survived. Um, so this is, I'm just going to show a short clip from the film that I made with David Stratton, which was my first film, so it's pretty hard going to show you first film. <laughs> um, uh, and it was it was made with Screen Australia to be broadcast on the ABC. Um, and so I'm just going to start by showing this clip. It's hard to know why the censors were afraid of sex. You couldn't say a lot of things, even if they were quite elliptical things. <laughs> All right, there's no need to be crude. When I became director of the Sydney Film Festival in 1966, we wanted to get a better deal for the film-going public. Australia had so much to offer, and yet this was such a petty side of Australia. Then came 1969. We had invited a Swedish film by Stig Bjorkman, and the film was called I Love, You Love. When Stig had already left Stockholm to travel here, I had a call from the film censor's office to say that they wanted to cut a scene from the film. I had persuaded the board of the Sydney Film Festival to agree that even one second cut would be tantamount to a ban. He can go and get stuffed. We were able to contact Stig, and I advised him what had happened, and I said, look, I understand if you want to go back to Sweden, but I would love you to come to Australia and fight this thing. At that time, in my mid-twenties, I was very conservative. In fact, I was quite conformist in just about every way. I think it was just on this issue that I was uh, passionate. Australian customs. Have you anything to declare? Have you got any indecent items? I'll have to look in your luggage. I first met Stig Bjorkman when he came out through immigration, uh, a bit jet lagged, and, and here was this mass scrum of reporters and television people wanting to ask him about this banned film, none of which they had seen, of course. What do you think of Sydney so far? Sorry about the sink there. That, I'm sure that was my fault. Um, so, so in making this film, I wanted to use this collection of all the clippings. So when you see those that archival footage, that is from this collection. Um, and this film that I made was my first film. It was funded by a Screen Australia initiative to be broadcast on the t on TV, which meant that we really had to fulfil all checks and balances of. Um, making sure that we cleared copyright, um, which was a huge challenge when you have no money. Um, and um, what that meant is this film is really the example in trying to circumnavigate sense, I mean, circumnavigate um, copyright and, and, and not pay, because otherwise a film like this would not have been made. Um, so I just wanted to talk through how I did that. I don't know how to change a slide. How do I? This, I'm not a good millennial. 
Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah, great. Um, so one of the things we did with this particular archive when we were using it is that I tried to start this process of clearing copyright by contacting people from who own the films. And it was a nightmare, you know, like thousands of dollars a second. It was absolutely impossible. So we started looking for works that had copyright expired or that were orphan works and we thought were low risk in terms of... Um, of you know, being sued for copyright. And then we added this element of putting criticism and review over the images that we um, were using so that that was our final check and balance if something came back to us. Um, and then the other thing we did was um, I wanted to use newspaper articles because this was a major news story that was all over the papers, but it's $400 per news article if you're going to use it in a film, which again, $8,000 film um, wasn't going to happen. And so we found out that um, the newspaper headings weren't protected under copyright, so we used the newspaper headings from the time, rewrote the articles so that there was writing there, and then used images we did have permission to use. So we basically warped history to be able to look like we're engaging with historical documents. And then finally, which was my personal favourite thing to do, was that because just footage of Australia at the time, again, out of reach for independent filmmakers, I started contacting people with home movie collections. And so found out whether they had images of Sydney in the 60s, and by doing that, You'd, people were very generous in offering up their personal records, and that's how we got that aesthetic of 1960s Australia. So um, in the end with this film, we were able to, to clear copyright for everything that we used, but it was this process of these compromises that we had to make and these like warping of historical sources um, to be able to do it. Um, and that was my first project. And then I got um, an, a, a fellowship from the Australian Film and Television School to not use this kind of cherry pick this collection, but actually really look at this entire collection of all these clippings. Um, and, uh, and that was funded under this initiative, which no longer exists, which is wonderful, which is they fund projects that wouldn't usually get funding. Um, and so they supported me to make this weird project with these, with these clips, um, which would be much longer. So I think um, I will show that. This is, so these are the two projects that I created from this one archive. And I think the reason why um, I, I think that it's interesting to talk about in the copyright context is that the first film is, was a short film. I had less time to work on it, but I was really, I was hemmed in by the, the need to make a commercially viable film that, um, that you know, adhered to copyright law. And as a result, I cherry-picked the collection and I wasn't kind of true to the archive that I had access to. And then as soon as I had the opportunity under um, you know, this project that was for educational purposes, that was no, never going to be distributed commercially and I could use it um, under fair dealing, then I came up with a very different type of film and a very different thesis. Um, and I had much more freedom to make a work that um, that you know explored something much more darker and complex than I was able to with the short film, um, and I think um, it raises a really interesting question when creators are hemmed in by by copyright law, um, how how we can continue to make the most provocative and interesting works, and um, that was something I really got from this experience of four years working with this collection. Um, and then another thing I just wanted to mention about this particular collection is that the only reason that I got access to it um, from the National Archive is they have very different policies around um, access for research than something like the National Film and Sound Archives where most of our film heritage is. So uh, they put onus on the creator to clear copyright when they provide research um, copies. But if this collection had been stored at the National Film and Sound Archives, nothing can be released until copyright is cleared. Um, so the fact that this exists is the peculiarity of a film collection being in the National Archives of Australia. Um, and I think if I was to speak candidly as a, as a creator, and I think um, 
that, that idea of the ecosystem where you wear multiple hats is definitely true in my experience because I am an artist, but I also use other people's works to create my work in these cases, that when I think about copyright as a creator, um, my first anxiety is, is about how to get around copyright so I can make the works that I want to do. My second anxiety um, is, well, am I going to get sued for this? And then the thing that I really haven't thought about and haven't really thought about until I was here today and attended was that, you know, my rights as a creator because I entered making work in a time where me and none of my contemporaries make a living out of being creators. Um, you know, we, we all have other jobs which sustain our income and we do art because we love it and we love to share the work with people. Um, so my relationship to copyright is, it has been so different. And I think that, um, you know, as someone who works in history and um, has an interest in making this material and all sorts of archives available to the public, that that's something I'd really like to, um, like to put on, um, on the agenda there that, uh, that, that we need to have freedom as artists to access this material so we can use our histories to illuminate our, presence, pres our present and our future. And, um, and that's something that uh, I think is really important for us all. Thank you. <laughs>